Hello and welcome to the Politics Hub. We're going to start tonight's programme with the latest from the Czech Republic, where at least 15 people have been killed after a gunman opened fire in central Prague. We can bring in our Europe correspondent, Siobhan uh, Robbins, who's across the latest. Siobhan, what can you tell us? Hi, Sophie. Well, we've had quite a detailed timeline now from the police and the interior minister who have been updating the press this evening about this very tragic shooting which has taken place. As you say, we know at least 15 people were killed uh, after a gunman opened fire at a university in downtown Prague. Now, what the police are telling us is, if I go through the timeline, they first received a call at around 12.20 saying that a 24-year-old man had left a village outside Prague, was heading towards Prague, and that he wanted to take his own life. Now, at around 12.45, they then found in that village the body of a dead man, which they later confirmed to be the 24-year-old student who is the gunman's father. Now, they established that this man heading into Prague uh, was a student uh, at the Faculty of Arts and that he had a lecture at two o'clock. So they went to the place where he was having the lecture. They evacuated the building. And then it was just before three o'clock at a different part of the university that they got the first reports of shots being fired. And then police later confirmed that the lifeless body of the gunman was found. But that was not before at least 15 people had been shot dead, dozens more injured. And when you look at pictures coming out of Prague at the time of that shooting, you can see people running for their lives, running across a bridge, crowding down really steep steps to try and get out of the vicinity uh, of that university. And the university building, there are, there are pictures of groups of students huddled together on a roof trying to hide themselves. We're actually told by Reuters news agency that uh, university staff who were in the building at the time uh, were told to barricade themselves in the rooms they were in, to close the curtains, pull down the blinds, turn off the lights, do anything they could to not draw attention to themselves. And you can only imagine the absolute horror uh, and trauma for the people who were involved in that. We understand there were at least 200 students uh, in that vicinity at the time of this shooting. So we do know this evening that the gunman responsible is dead. Uh, the police and the authorities also telling us they don't believe this is connected to a wider network. They don't believe that he is a terrorist. Uh, there is also a suggestion from the police that he may have been inspired from a shooting, a mass shooting that he'd heard about that had happened abroad. But really the motivation behind this crime, that is exactly what the police are now focusing on as they try to get to grips with what's happened in Prague. Um, really, as you say, uh, Siobhan, those images that we've seen of people huddling on roofs, of people trying to protect their own lives at the university, really horrific. Um, um, Siobhan, you say that the police say they're not treating it as a terrorist incident. What have the politicians been saying? So we've heard from the Interior Minister who was echoing those lines, saying that he was very impressed by the police response, reassuring people that they didn't believe this was a terrorist attack, talking not just to the people of the Czech Republic, but also to people who are visiting Prague, because, of course, Prague is extremely popular at Christmas, people drawn uh, to the Christmas markets. And he was saying, for international visitors, we don't believe this is part of a wider network. We do believe that the immediate risk has gone, but also underlining that the emergency services are still at the university building. They've been sweeping the building, not just looking for other threats. So, for example, a journalist told us they were looking to see if there were any explosives, which thankfully they haven't found, but also looking to make sure that there isn't anyone injured that they've missed or anyone still barricaded in a room wondering if it's safe to get out. So they're still focusing on that part of clearing the scene before they can really get to grips of why this has happened. And we've also heard from the Prime Minister uh, of the Czech Republic who offered his condolences to all those involved, um, particularly, of course, those shot and their families, but also wishing well those who've been injured and asking the people of the Czech Republic to come together at this really difficult time. Thank you so much, Siobhan. Siobhan Robbins there uh, with the latest from a very fast evolving situation in Prague. At least 15 people killed and 24 injured at the Charles University uh, in Prague, an arts faculty in the heart of that city's historic centre. Well, earlier the Czech Prime Minister was speaking at a press conference.
It ensured that the security forces have a situation fully under control and there is no further danger for the citizens of the Czech Republic. Nevertheless, I would like to ask everybody for their understanding and cooperation of the police and the rescue services and for respecting their instructions. I would also like to thank all of those who have been involved in containing this difficult situation. We are doing everything necessary in order to provide assistance to those injured, to their families and the families of the victims. Dear fellow compatriots, let us all think about those who lost their loved ones and for whom this year's Christmas will be incredibly sad. Let us share their sadness and their pain. In this difficult moment, we should all come together and show our mutual understanding and in this way express our respect towards the victims of this brutal crime. Once again, I would like to express my condolences to the families of the victims and I hope that those injured recover very soon. Thank you for your attention. We will see you again at the press conference following the meeting of the government. Well, that was the Czech Prime Minister. We are expecting to hear from the Czech President, I should say, um, imminently. We'll bring you that as soon as we have it. But in the meantime, we can talk now to our panel for tonight. The former Home Secretary, Jackie Smith, former senior diplomat at UK and UK National Security Advisor, Lord Peter Ricketts. Two extremely well-qualified people, uh, I should say, uh, for you know, an involving incident like this. Um, Lord Ricketts, the police are saying that they're not treating this as a, as a terrorist incident, aren't they? They are. I mean, we mustn't jump to conclusions, but at first sight, it looks very like those lone shooter attacks in America, uh, where an individual, for whatever reason, suddenly decides to move to do this awful thing. It's the most nightmare for the intelligence agencies because there's no planning, no preparation, no communications to pick up, no way anyone could see this coming, and yet they have to deal with the aftermath of it. So. Um, it's a nightmare to deal with. It seems that the um, police reacted very quickly, but nonetheless an awful lot of people killed, presumably one of these automatic weapons used, which can do terrible damage in a short time. Yes, a death toll, like you say. Uh, it's really quite shocking, Ooh, to be honest. Absolutely appalling. Uh, quite shocking. And Jackie, as a former Home Secretary, you will have, I guess, some experience yourself of being in these kind of situations and how politicians and the um, institutions, if you like, have to react. Yes, and I... Um... I uh, heard the Interior Minister of um, the Czech Republic talking and um, it took me back a bit to, um, you know, similar circumstances that I experienced as Home Secretary. And of course, the important thing at a time like this for uh, everybody is not to speculate, mm. for those responsible to gather the information as quickly as possible so that people understand what the situation is and sometimes actually as a politician what you need to do is to uh, allow that to happen to hear what the agencies and the and law enforcement are finding out about the situation and then to do as the interior minister and the prime minister are doing to communicate that to reassure people particularly if you're clear that it isn't a terrorist attack. And, you know, the first thing you need to do is to actually try to find these things out. But if you, you're sure it isn't a terrorist attack, then actually reassurance about the containment of the incident is actually really, really important. As well, obviously, as sharing the pain and showing em empathy for what is a terrible situation in the centre of your country, which will obviously have an impact on lots of people, both directly and indirectly. Yeah, it's interesting, those kind of two very important dual things to, <laughs> I guess, give people that reassurance that the police are saying that the gunman is dead. Uh, but also, of course, as you say, it's still you know, at least 15 people killed mm. and 24 injured. I mean, this is a, a very big, serious incident that has uh, happened. What will the agencies be doing now? Well, I think one of the first questions they would ask is, is this part of a group? Yeah. Might there be other people? Uh, might there be other attacks to come? Uh, and uh, they must be very sure now for the Interior Minister to say that, that they think this was a lone operator. There isn't a wider threat to, to people in Prague. That's, of course, a great relief. But a lot of painstaking investigations now going to have to go on as to 
why this, this young person decided to do this, where they got this powerful, uh, basically war-type weapon to use in the centre of Prague, you know, what links he may have had, you know, why was he suddenly uh, moved to do this. So lots of investigation to, to follow up, but it is reassuring this doesn't seem to be part of a, any wider terrorist threat. And as you say, as, as, as Lord Ricketts was saying, you know, the, the, the gun itself, the fact that a single person is able to wreak this devastation, I mean, that is something that I guess will be looked at as well. Well, I'm sure it will be, you know, as, as Peter says, where the weapon came from. And I suppose, you know, this is one of those occasions where you think, actually, thank goodness, as far as the UK is concerned, that it is so difficult to get hold of weapons. And when you hear the suggestion that the police think that perhaps he was um, uh, inspired is an awful word, but that he, he learned about this from somewhere overseas. I suppose your thoughts turn to the US where, of mm, course, yeah. this sadly is something that we have seen on more than one occasion yeah. where the failure to properly control guns, of course, has led to that happening. Yeah. They, they are more widely available on continental Europe than they are here. That's interesting. Uh, and I think interior ministers and public have long time tried to crack down on the availability of guns mm. because they do, of course, amplify mm. the devastation that can be wreaked even by a single individual. Yes, absolutely right. Thank you both very much uh, for bringing us your own experiences to this. Thank you. Now, we have been getting a reaction on Sky News to this developing incident. A bit earlier, we heard from Mikhail Tomesh, who is a journalist in Prague. Let's have a listen. What we know, there was a recent uh, press, in, uh, press conference by the Czech uh, Minister of Interior and a President of Police. And we know that the shooter was a 24-year-old man who had legally obtained uh, firearms and he decided to go to the university he studied and decided to kill people. Uh, what we also know is that he, before that he probably killed his father and after the killing of his father, he arrived to Prague and, and started shooting here in the, in the city center. We know that there are uh, at least 15 victims and multiple, multiple injured people. And do you know how seriously some of those injured are? The police said early on that nine were seriously injured. Yeah, yeah, they, they didn't provide uh, any any further further information. The, the information are very scarce, and uh, also like a few minutes before the official numbers of the victims uh, were published, uh, there were numbers like uh, four victims and few few injured. But this number quickly quickly rose as uh, also police started to search the building. You mentioned there are several firearms. Do you know what kind of firearms were used? Uh, we know uh, at least about one, and it was a, a long uh, sniper rifle. There had been photos of this shooter uh, going uh, on, the, on the roof of the building, and uh, he was shooting with, uh, with this gun, but we don't know now how many weapons he, he used. I was just talking uh, to a, another journalist who mentioned this... Um, post on a social media platform where he had apparently said, I hate the world and I want to leave it behind. Do you, I mean, do you have any more details on, uh, on yeah, the motive yeah, just, and, or what he was saying? Uh, ju ju just before uh, I arrived at the crime scene, I was at the office where we read uh, and it was, a, it was a Telegram account where he published his thoughts and it was basically about how he... Uh, hates this world, how nobody loves him, and uh, information like this. Uh, interesting is that all these uh, all these statuses, statuses were written in Russian, and also uh, there are information that probably he was inspired by a mass shooting in Russia. But uh, the shooter was a Czech citizen. Right, and I mean the impact on that city where you are must be just devastating. Uh, yeah, of course. It's right before Christmas and uh, the Charles University building is a few hundred metres from Old Town Square, which is like a Christmas hotspot with uh, the Christmas tree and market. And I when I just arrived at uh, close to this crime scene, uh, I arrived through one of the Christmas markets and they were totally empty. So the city is absolutely shocked 
but also when I first arrived at the crime scene, when the when the shooter was still in the building, a lot of people didn't know what's going on. They were maybe a little bit upset because the transportation in the town was totally halted. So the subway uh, subway station was closed, so people are upset. But I think uh, how people are are going home, uh, watching the TV, reading uh, reading the news, uh, the the. Uh, the situation in following days will be very sad. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I don't want to... I mean, there is speculation on social media, but the police have said nothing about the victims, who the victims were. Do we know anything officially about who the victims were? Uh, well, they were the students of the of the Charles uh, University, but uh, probably they were not his classmates because he wasn't attending uh, this faculty uh, exactly, which is right behind me. He was attending uh, his school in a different building in the Prague city center. So, but we don't know why he decided to go to to the other building. Uh, it, the building where the shooting occurred is much bigger, and there were more students. So maybe one of his motives was to kill as many people as he can, but probably we will find out uh, in following days. That's my colleague Mark Austin doing that interview there with a journalist uh, from the sort of devastated city of Prague. Earlier today, the Prague police chief, uh, Martin von der Esek, and the Czech interior minister, that's Vic Rakerson, gave a press conference with updates from the scene. Let's take a listen to it. Good evening. Allow me to provide you some initial information concerning the tragic event which occurred in the building of the Faculty of Arts at Palach Square this afternoon. The Czech police received a report at 12.20 that a 24-year-old man from the village of Hostoum supposedly left for the capital, Prague, after he said that he wanted to take his own life. At 12.45, it was reported that in the same village, a body of a dead man was found. We soon established that it was the father of the suspect who committed this terrible crime today. Quite quickly, we established that he was a student of the Faculty of Arts. We established that in the building of the Faculty of Arts in Saletna Street, he was supposed to attend a lecture at 2 o'clock. That's why we immediately arrived at Saletna Street. We entered the building and we evacuated the building in Saletna Street. The evacuation was completed at 14.22. We continued our search for this man. At 14.59, we received first reports about the shooting in the building of the Faculty of Arts here at Palach Square. The first office, officer, of, officers arrived within minutes. At 15.20, the police on site reported that the lifeless body of the shooter was on the gallery of the building. Right now we know that more than 15 people lost their lives during this event. We know that at least 24 people were injured and obviously have been provided with immediate assistance. However, we would like to ask you for your understanding because we are still continuing our response in the building. There are searches, there are checks, and we still don't have any final information. We haven't even started identifying those who were shot because the building first needs to be safe for us and for everybody else. And I might just add that based on the information we have received in the recent minutes, it appears that this person was inspired by a terrible event, a similar terrible event abroad. Obviously, we would like to express our condolences to all those who lost their loved ones, to all of the families, 
zde přišli o život. I just want to uh, bring you an interview next because we're joined on the phone now by Maya Osterdell, who was walking past the faculty just a minute before the shooting began. Uh, she talks to us uh, now. Thank you so much for being with us. I know it must be an extremely difficult evening for you, so we really do appreciate you talking to us and your experience as well. So you were just walking along. Um, what happened? Well, hello. I uh, I can just tell you what I experienced, of course, and what I saw. Um, I was having my business lunch and uh, was going back to my office. I work in a building which is called Rudolfinum. It's uh, in the Palach Square and uh, it's uh, right next to the Faculty of Arts. And now I, I realized that uh, actually I was passing the Faculty of Arts just a few minutes before the shooting started because when I got into my office, uh, a colleague of mine told me there is shooting at the Faculty of Arts. And I thought he was making fun of me because um, this is something which you don't experience or we haven't experienced here. So uh, when I learned that it was really <laughs> true and serious, we went to the outer part of our building, Rudolfinum, where we could uh, see the whole scene in the Palach Square. And what could you see? Well, uh, I must say that uh, uh, the police was already there and um, it was very professional uh, the way they handled the whole scene, uh, the whole situation. I mean, they closed the area very quickly. It was really within minutes. And then what we could see was uh, evacuating some of the students or people from the Faculty of Arts towards the Palach uh, Square and our building, actually. And uh, there were groups of these people being evacuated. Uh, and then uh, I must say that I could watch a police sniper for a while who was uh, aiming at the Faculty of Arts. There were some policemen on the uh, like upper balcony of of the building, but I couldn't see the uh, the um, the guy who was shooting because um, I don't know it was probably already over, or uh, I don't know simply. Yeah, it does feel like everything happened extremely quickly, uh, even though that mm -hmm. death toll is still so devastating: fifteen killed, twenty-four people injured. It must have been so strange to you having a business lunch, looking over at a university and seeing these horror, horror scenes, uh, you know, evolving or hearing about them evolving in a place that is very normal to you. Well, I must admit that I used to work as a, <laughs> as a crisis manager. So I, uh, of course, I mean, it affects you, but I, I was in a slightly different position, maybe than other people who were watching it, who were really a bit scared and, uh, and and nervous. And then, of course, the people who were evacuated towards our building and then were taken in the building uh, uh, for, you know, like a police procedure. You could see that they were really shocked. They were, of course, uh, trying to call their families. They were talking to each other. They were sharing the their feelings, so it was uh, quite um, a stressful scene, of course. Yeah, of course. We're looking at pictures of Prague now, uh, such a historic and beautiful place. Can you give us a sense about the area that, that this happened in? Uh, may I ask you to repeat the question because the line is not that clear uh, once again. I was going to say, what, what is it like, the area where the shooting happened? Uh, the area where the shooting happened uh, is actually um, basically right in the center of Prague because uh, it's close to the Old Town Square and the square where our building, Rudolfinum, is and the Faculty of Arts is located is actually facing the uh, Prague Castle. There is a bridge, there is area on the other side of the uh, of the Vltava River, but uh, it's basically the centre of, of uh, Prague. 
Okay, thank you so much. It's been you know, really interesting and, and, and useful to speak to you this evening. So thank you for giving us your time. You're welcome. Bye. Well, joining us now, also from Prague, uh, is the journalist and teacher Robert Muller. Thank you for being with us uh, this evening on what is such a difficult day for uh, Prague. Can you just explain what you know about what happened? Uh, good evening. Well, uh, I know what actually has been reported actually that uh, around 3 p.m. this is uh, about around 3 p.m. today, the police received the call about uh, a report about a shooting at the Faculty of Arts, which is uh, which is in the very center of Prague. And since they were already uh, searching for the man who later out, later turned out to be the perpetrator of the of the shooting, they were quite uh, swiftly at the scene and uh, it was actually the whole thing was over in about half an hour in, in during which uh, the man um, uh, shot uh, those uh, 15 people and wounded uh, twice as many others. And you say the whole thing over in about half an hour but still the number uh, of people dead and injured um, devastating. Police are saying that they're not treating it as a terrorist incident. Well uh, as, as we understand from the police, they are not treating it as a terrorist incident because, I mean, as, as, uh, he was a it, it was a lone shooter, and apparently uh, it, it's a, it has also been reported that he had some his, has some history of uh, mental instability, and uh, he was apparently wanted by the police in connection with a with another shooting, which happened uh, about half an hour drive from Prague where a man was found dead this morning who who most likely is the father of the of the shooter so it was uh, an act of uh, a lone man uh, the prime minister and, and the minister of interior they both confirmed that they have no indication that this uh, that this thing would be anyhow connected to any terrorist activities uh, in europe or uh, in, in the world it's interesting isn't it because we often hear about these of lone gunman situations in America. Is it something that is familiar in, in, in Prague? Well, it hasn't been until today because this is the, this is the first time something like that happened in Prague. Although we did have uh, some similar uh, incidents uh, four years ago, there was a man who entered the hospital in a town in the, eastern, in the east of the country where, because he felt he was unfairly treated by the doctors and he started shooting with a from the from the sidearm and he uh, killed around four or five people and four years before that in 2015 we had an, a similar incident there was a it was a pensioner who entered the restaurant and then started shooting people and killed i think eight or nine persons so this is definitely the first time in prague it's, it is the worst such incident in the modern history of this country and as you said uh we up till today uh, we just saw uh, such news coming from uh, Across uh, from across the Atlantic, uh, mostly from the United States or maybe some other countries, but definitely not here. So that's why oh. that's what makes it uh, even more shocking. How easy is it to access guns in Prague? Uh, actually, uh, uh, in the Czech Republic, it is not that easy to obtain uh, a firearm. Uh, one needs to go through uh, psychological testing. One needs to go through a through a training. Uh, the guns are registered with the with the authorities so and, and th this man as it's been reported he had his guns uh, legally so somehow he made the checks and uh, but in gen generally speaking it's not it's not too easy uh, to obtain a firearm in the country okay thank you very much uh, for taking the time to talk to us this evening robert muller there thank you, thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. well we're staying in prague and we can talk now to Eva de Croix, who is a Czech member of parliament from the Civic Democratic Party. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, I expect you want to offer your condolences to the victims in this tragic incident. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the interest and uh, for all this time uh, you're giving uh, to, uh, to, the, to the Prague today. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not the best day uh, we could imagine. Uh, only a few days before Christmas, uh, but I think it's very important uh, that we are today uh, with the victims uh, and uh, we are giving all our attention uh, as member of the parliament and as uh, the whole government uh, who will meet uh, in one and a half hour uh, 
in urgency uh, to discuss what happened today and uh, what we have to do in order to uh, keep uh, the whole society calm and to ensure that there is no more risk for anybody in Prague or, or any, anywhere else. People will be frightened, of course. Um, it's interesting to hear the police say that they're not treating it as a terror incident. They believe the gunman's father was also found dead and that the gunman himself is now dead. How safe do you think Prague is now? I think in general, the, the population uh, has the feeling of safety. Uh, according to all the information uh, we had uh, through the afternoon, uh, uh, we know uh, um, that uh, it was uh, the act of somebody who's mentally sick, who made ready this act uh, for many months uh, for the reasons uh, which are not related to any other group of terrorists or there is no uh, no known support uh, of uh, any other group. Uh, I'm uh, really uh, proud or happy to see that uh, the crisis management of the situation in Prague was uh, very man- very well managed. The communication um, uh, towards the population, towards the tourists uh, also uh, is really done in a very professional way. It's important to note it because uh, Czech Republic uh, is not a place uh, to be uh, 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 to be uh, uh, used to this kind of, uh, of attack. We, are, we feel like a very safe country. Uh, uh, this huge event, uh, we, we live it for the first time. We never lived it in the past. Uh, so uh, the fact that uh, even it's for the first time, and, uh, let's hope that uh, for the at least for quite long time, uh, last time, uh, and we see that uh, the police and all the rescue components, the Minister of Interiors, uh, are acting uh, in a very good, uh, good way. The information is uh, is uh, going uh, in direct and safe way. Uh, there is no disinformation today uh, spread uh, uh, on the on the social media. It's important to see it. So, uh, of course, that the whole nation is now in this moment uh, watching the TV is now uh, uh, looking for uh, some uh, kind of calm and Christmas uh, mood. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, but uh, I think we do everything we can do uh, in this moment. OK, thank you very much indeed uh, for the update from Prague there. We are getting some news now of a update from the police in Prague. Let's listen. For the moment, we are not aware of any link to the victims, any link to the site and I believe, right now I believe, that the victims were randomly selected by someone with no criminal record. And to conclude with, I would like to clarify the number of the victims and the injured. For the moment, I can confirm 14 victims of this horrible crime and 25 injured, out of which 10 seriously injured. And one final piece of information for all family members or other people who urgently need information. We now have an information line 9004823158. It is based at Prague Police Offices. The line is manned by police officers, rescue services, as well as officials of uh, the municipal office. Right now, we would like to provide relevant information, and therefore, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, there will be a press briefing in Congress Street, press briefing of the Prague Police, and you will receive more information about the incident 
about the intervention during the incident as well as the activities of the police since the Klanovica incident. Good evening. Once again, I would like to express my condolences to all family members and friends of the victims of this crazy massacre, which is an unprecedented event in the Czech Republic or in Prague. And there are things that I need and want to say as the Minister of Interior. I believe that the police of the Czech Republic carry out very good work. I'm not only talking about the uh, incident today. It was very professional. The numbers of the victims could have been really high. The police who were first on site were really brave, entered the building immediately and forced the perpetrator to hold a certain position and made sure that potential victims are evacuated. It was very professional. They arrived within minutes. The SWAT unit was there within 12 minutes. All of the services were there. Let us imagine a solitary shooter with no criminal record who holds his weapons legally and who commits, probably committed a brutal murder in the Klanovice forest. Someone who had no links to the victims, who had no criminal records, and therefore couldn't have been suspected. I think the police did everything they could. The mayor of Klanovice thanked me today to say she was very grateful for what the Czech police were doing. They really did everything they could to catch the perpetrator. Once again, I would like to ask you to allow the police to do their work. All sorts of facts are being verified and checked. The police, together with experts, are identifying the victims. I'm in touch with the Minister of Foreign Affairs. We have a direct line in order to notify any consular offices in Prague in case any of the victims is a foreign national. We also have a crisis line now. We are providing emergency assistance. We are putting together lists of names of people who were in the building. They are being provided with emergency assistance. Once we identify the victims, again, people will be on hand to help the family members put up with the situation. We have the system. Again, please only share information published by the Czech police. I think we have seen that the police is really trying to provide information which is as up-to-date and as precise as possible. Let us not share any misinformation and this goes for individuals or for the media. Only share information that you will receive from official sources. There is misinformation which says that apparently this person was a Ukrainian national. It is not true. And most likely that was an attack uh, from a Russian troll farm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, really just very briefly, I would like to tell you that although the perpetrator that is dead and investigation is going on, Prague prosecutor is on site and she's doing everything to make sure that the police is able to investigate. I intentionally mentioned a version which, from our point of view, is very realistic and it is related to, or, to what we found in the Kladno region. I can't provide you with any more details. I just want to emphasize that before the attack in the Kladno region, we didn't know the identity of the attacker and couldn't have known the identity of the attacker. 
společně byli jeden, jestli dobře chápu, to znamená, že on nějaké vybušení, něco, co mohlo jako zabít víc lidí, aniž by on držel zbraň v ruce, ano? Já v tuto chvíli nemohu potvrdit žádné výbušniny, ale mohu potvrdit... Right, I can't confirm the presence of and explosives, but there was a large quantity of munition, ammunition, and if the police hadn't entered the building in time, the perpetrator wouldn't have been dead on the roof at 1520 and there would have been a lot more victims. An update there from the police in Prague confirming 14 people dead and 25 injured. A slight update on the numbers there. 10 of those 25 seriously injured. They also said that the number of victims could have been much higher without the professionalism of the police who arrived on the scene within minutes. And that the victims were randomly selected by someone with no criminal record, a lone shooter who legally acquired the weapon that they used. Well, let's return to Eva de Croix, uh, shall we, a Czech member of Parliament from the Civic Democratic Party. Thank you for staying with us throughout that uh, update. The point was made about the fact that the police reacted almost instantly and that the number of victims could have been higher if they hadn't. You know, I'm speaking here as a politician, and I think the worst thing a politician may do in the situation of crisis is to allow uh, himself uh, any kind of speculation. So uh, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, speculate if it could be worse uh, or if it could be better. I may only uh, take uh, account the fact that uh, there is uh, in the building uh, was uh, or were in the moment of the attack uh, several uh, maybe hundreds of students. You know that the, the overall uh, amount of uh, murdered students today uh, are at about 15. Uh, I may also uh, take account that uh, the uh, direction of the police, of the firemen, of the security services, uh, of the prosecutors, of the Minister of Interior was really professional. Uh, I really do not want to open any kind of thought if it could be uh, done differently, better, quicker, uh, I'm really sure that uh, they did everything they could do considering the situation. And we just heard uh, uh, from the chief uh, of, the, of the police uh, that uh, the time of direction was really uh, at about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, it could be worse, uh, but uh, we cannot say this because uh, the situation uh, is already very bad uh, for all the families uh, and uh, for all of us uh, because it's something uh, you never want uh, it happen, uh, even if it will concern uh, one, one uh, only student. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you. So just to update you, 14 people killed, 25 injured, 10 seriously uh, in a attack in Prague. The gunman was believed to have no criminal record, uh, to be a lone shooter who legally acquired the weapon and that he randomly selected the victims. We can talk now to our correspondent, Tom uh, Cheshire, who's following the story for us here at Sky News. Tom, what can you tell us? Yeah, I mean, maybe it's helpful at this stage after that latest uh, news conference just to see what we do know, the timeline that's come out over the course of the day. Um, the first reports of a shooting were at 2.59 p.m. local time at the Charles University Faculty of Arts, but that wasn't where the day's events actually began. Um, the shooter's father was discovered dead at a village around 20 kilometres away from Prague, uh, a town rather. Um, we, th that was believed to have happened. There were reports of someone heading into town saying they wanted to kill themselves. As a result of that, um, the Czech police said that they had um, evacuated buildings in the university um, in anticipation of that. They'd ordered the evacuation of a university building in the capital where they suspected uh, he would attend a lecture. Nevertheless, the suspect um, opened fire in a different building and he's reported to have been found dead at 3.20. We don't know the manner of that death. As you say, the police there confirming that 14 people were killed in that 
uh, 25 injured, 10 seriously injured, there is the potential that um, that death toll could be higher. And absolutely terrifying scenes uh, throughout Prague. This is a very central part of Prague. It's very busy this time of year. Uh, and you saw students, um, presumably students, on those buildings, lowering themselves onto the parapets on the edge um, of these students to get away from the shooter. Other students have been told to stay inside. They're blocking doors uh, while this gunman was there. Um, hearing from the interior minister uh, of Czechia that it took 12 minutes for the SWAT team to arrive. And they were emphasizing the point, um, as you mentioned, Sophie, that this uh, suspect wasn't known to the police. His guns were acquired legally. Um, so this is the first they had it. But I still think um, as they deal with this, there are going to be questions about that response. If they did know that someone was into town uh, and they knew he was going to this university, even if it was a quick response, perhaps uh, it shouldn't have got that far at all. Again, the Interior Ministry is saying that many poor people might have been killed. He had a large amount of ammunition uh, until the police were there. Uh, and also the nature, um, if those guns were legally owned, um, there of course, is going to be a debate around that. Uh, but that's the latest. 14 people killed, 25 injured, 10 of them seriously. Tom, thank you very much indeed. Tom Cheshire there. Well, the shooting in Prague is sure to feature in tomorrow's newspapers. We'll have our extended press preview and news review from 10.30 this evening with tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. We'll be joined by the columnist and broadcaster Steve Richards and the former Conservative Special Advisor Salma Shah. Coming up here on Sky, we'll of course bring you any more developments from Prague when we have them. But up next on the Politics Hub. We will have the latest on a climb down on immigration policy from the Home Secretary. Myself and Nish are here at the uh, Bill Murray Comedy Club in Angel, which is one of our favourite comedy clubs. And they have been amazing helping us do our second year of food drives for the Trussell Trust, but the Hackney Food Bank in particular. And one of the reasons we wanted to do it is uh, it's, it's our local food bank here, but the need has jumped up 66% since last year, and last year was already too high. Um, and as Nish said, it's been a particularly bad year um, for a lot of people, exactly as uh, just in case that's that's the um, sign language for bad. pretty, pretty bad. Um, and they're uh, currently needing to give out a million emergency food parcels this year. And because everyone's so strapped, the donations have gone down, which is, uh, you know, very hard on the, on the food banks as well. So we're trying to drive up some donations um, from around the country. But people are just so generous, though. They're, I think... I think people are looking to do something community orientated around this time of year that's not just all about want but that's actually connecting with people and I think that's a, a big part of it. Well last year we had um, a smaller gig here at the Bill Murray and this year we've moved it to Earth and Hackney because it sold out in about 24 hours but also one of the big things the Trussell Trust are trying to, to push is this guarantee the essentials plan which is where we don't, we would love if today was all about donating kind of like Christmassy things. Instead, we are needing uh, tinned foods and sanitary products and stuff like that, which is so basic that you, my heart breaks for anyone who, who needs to go out and seek those things from, from food banks. And I think the essentials for most people should be guaranteed by the government. It's, it's awful that people have to go to food banks for things like bread, butter, eggs, and, and just hygiene products. Yeah, the Trussell Trust are always very open about how their mission statement is for themselves to no longer exist. Like, they, they don't believe that they should be having to do this, but we're all very relieved that they are doing it because they're stepping into the gap and helping people who need it the most, and we are very proud to be working with them. I would say if this is something you like the look of, if for, say, Easter or... Um, or what other holidays are there? Halloween. Diwali. Diwali, Ramadan, Ramadan that there is any um, centre or community centre around you where you want to put on something, the need, the need to connect and the want to donate is out there. So please do donate to your food banks. They are desperately in need of donations uh, this year in particular. And if you are in need of going to a food bank, oh my God, go and get in touch with the Trussell Trust um, to look after yourself. Hello and welcome back to the Politics Hub. Now, the government's plan to reduce legal migration numbers into the UK provoked controversy and dissent from almost all sides. And tonight it looks like they have sneaked out pretty major change before 
Christmas. Our chief political correspondent, John Craig, is here to tell us more. John, what's happened? What has happened is two days after Parliament rose, Mr Cleverly, rather than go and face MPs in the Commons, has announced that one of the most controversial bits of his five-point plan that he announced in early December, that was the one to increase what's called the minimum income uh, requirements for people if they want to bring a spouse or partner from overseas to the UK. At the moment, it's 18,600. Mr Cleverly said he was going to more than double that to 38,700. Well, tonight, it's only going to be, at least to start with, £29,000. It is quite a climb down. It comes from Mr Cleverly less than, what, six weeks in the job. Could it be the first of many retreats? I mean, <clears throat> bearing in mind, as well as illegal immigration, he's got to the battle ahead with Tory backbenchers over the Stop the Boats bill uh, in, uh, in um, January. Opposition MPs are scathing tonight. Um, Alistair Carmichael has said, um, you have to wonder who's in charge at the Home Office or if anyone is. It was clear to everyone else that the raising of the earnings threshold was unworkable. Another half-thought-through idea to placate the hardliners on their own back benches. Now, there was also fury from uh, various campaign groups and families who had this week announced plans for legal action. Yvette Cooper tonight has said more chaos and immigration. They've rowed back and rushed this out this announcement out. Looks sneaky, doesn't look good. Maybe Christmas, but I think Mr Cleverly will get a lot of flack from Tory backbenchers over this. Not so cleverly. Oh, John Craig, uh, thank you uh, very much indeed, our chief political correspondent there. Right, let's talk to uh, Jackie and Peter about this, uh, shall we? Sneaked out, according to John. Well, yes, but I think through a, an answer given by a member of the House of Lords or something. Um, when James Cleverley took over from Suella Bravman, I think we felt that, that possibly uh, there was going to be a slightly more serious approach to policy in the Home Office and the previous tendency to look for headlines rather than to actually make a difference would move on. It appears not, because, as John has made clear, you know, these were announcements that were very much about showing the government getting tough, <clears throat> and now they've had to retreat on them. It's, a, it's really disappointing in terms of good policy making, in terms of the reputation of the Home Office uh, and the Home Secretary. And I think the opposition are quite justified in saying it does suggest that these announcements were all about headlines and not at all about actually delivering something different. Yes, and perhaps they took some account of the enormous backlash they had when they set that number, bearing in mind that that would have an impact on a lot of people who are doing crucial jobs in this country, in the NHS, in the social care sector and other places. If they can't bring their spouses and families, they may not stay in the UK. And at a time when we're struggling to fill the jobs, that's quite material. This is not the only headache he's got, uh, because John mentioned the uh, Ill so-called Illegal Migration Bill, which is heading towards the House of Lords in the new year. That's going to have a very, very bumpy time there indeed, I think. Weeks and weeks of debate about some of the proposals in that. And so there are other areas where Mr Cleverly might look at for some further major concessions. Yeah, it really does. Um, that's, I think, a pretty safe prediction uh, for 2024. Um, it's our final politics hub of the year, so I thought it would be quite good to kind of reflect a bit on what 2024 is going to bring. It's going to be a bumper year. I think it's two billion people voting, the biggest ever election year, uh, UK, US, India. Jackie, what's your sort of predictions for what, what we might see? Well, I mean, first of all, for anybody interested in politics, as you say, it's an enormously important year. So in the UK, almost certainly, uh, I think certainly, we're going to see a, a general election and obviously Labour feel hopeful, although I hope not overconfident, uh, oh, about... You can be a bit confident now, <laughs> can't you, Jackie? Oh, Surely. No, 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 I'm very, I'm very uh, careful <laughs> about uh, that, M much as I might wish for it. But, of course, we've also got elections in the US. We've got elections quite early on in the year in Taiwan, which can, will be enormously significant. We've got elections in for the European Union uh, as well, and it will be interesting to see whether or not that move to a more... Um, sort of populist right uh, level of support, which of course is driving concerns about migration across Europe as well, uh, will then translate into MEPs elected into the European Parliament. So, all, you know, 
don't turn off in 2024 if you're interested in politics. Yeah, it's going to be extraordinary, isn't it? What are your sort of predictions for next year? Yeah, it's a year of wars and elections, isn't it? We've got two wars going on. The Gaza-Israel issue has to reach some kind of a solution uh, in the course of next year. Ukraine may as well, uh, as Western support begins to uh, look more shaky for that. And elections, there are some elections where the outcome is not very uncertain. Mm. Russia, for example, mm, uh, probably India. I mean, I'm not sure that there is huge sort of cliffhanger there. But yes, the European Parliament elections, which will produce a new commission, the UK elections, and at the end of the year, the big one, the US election. And I think if I had one wish for 2024, it would be we come to the end of the year without the prospect of Mr. Trump in the White House, That's a big which I think would be an enormous shake, you know, shock uh, and problem for all of us across the West. We can all drink to that, I think, Peter. Yeah, I think it's probably a consent <laughs> on the panel. On, on, on Not that, that I want to interfere one. in US political Obviously. affairs, <laughs> but that's my wish. You, you mentioned the awards at the beginning, and it, perhaps you know, it is worth a thought on the... Israel Hamas war because it has been such a big part of the year that we've seen. Um, it feels we're in a quite depressing place, to be honest, with, with, with it. Do you see any hope for the next year? Well, there have been terrifying levels of casualties, enormous suffering now in Gaza mm. after the awful terrorist attack in Israel, starvation, disease really looming. Uh, and there are these uh, long negotiations about a UN resolution, We're still waiting to hear where that comes out. Mm. Purpose of that is to get more humanitarian aid in more quickly to Gaza. And I just hope that that can be passed and that in due course we can get to a ceasefire that will stop the killing of civilians in Gaza. What happens after that, mm. you know, is going to be really difficult. Who's going to take on governing Gaza? Who's going to make sure that the reconstruction works and the politics come back so the Palestinians have some sort of a horizon. That's the real difficult thing that needs to be faced in 2024. Um, we haven't got loads of time left, but what's your wish for next year, Jackie? Um, well, I do wish that we would have a Labour government by the end of next year. You won't be surprised to hear. Fair, fair enough. <laughs> uh, thank you both uh, for being on uh, this evening's uh, programme uh, with that big breaking news story. So. Uh, good to uh, have you here um, and have a very good Christmas. Well, that is it for us uh, tonight. Um, a big uh, breaking news event, of course, uh, in Prague that we're going to be covering on Sky News uh, throughout. It's our final politics hub of the year, uh, but we will have plenty more updates from Prague uh, on Sky News, uh, where we know uh, that 14 people uh, confirmed uh, killed and a total of 25 injured, 10 seriously by a lone gunman. Up next, up, next up is Neil with the UK Tonight and more on that developing story. Good night.